albeit virtually. I had a day in London yesterday, so I have to say it was quite strange being with real people and um, uh, being able to speak to people as you went into a meeting and, and came out of it as well. But um, um, welcome to everybody. Um, uh, Nicola, do you just want to formally record the apologies that we've received, please? I will, Chair. We've had apologies from Wendy Reid, Laura Roberts, Patrick Mitchell and John Latham. On the call today, we have Harpreet Sood, Alex Wallace, Andrew Morris, Callum Pallister, David Farrelly, Deborah Ship, Andrew Foster, Giles Denham, Jack Dignan Murphy, James Freed, Jessica Newton, Joe Lenehan, Lee Whitehead, Liz May, Luke Williams, Mark Radford, Naveen Evans, Bob Smith. So my list says I can now see more. Soraya Dillon and Keith Wright. OK, brilliant. OK, uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so just um, by way of uh, kicking off the meeting, um, I want to just draw to the board's attention uh, formally that it's been confirmed that both uh, Liz Mir, uh and Andrew George's uh, terms have been extended as board members of Health Education England. So um, I think we're delighted about that. So congratulations, Liz and um, uh, Andrew George. Um, I'm also pleased to let you know that the Secretary of State has decided to extend my term for a thir further three years from the 1st of October. So uh, I'm uh, delighted to be able to spend uh, more time uh, with Naveena, uh, the executive team, uh, and of course this board uh, and this important work we've got to take forward over this period of time. So that's um, that's good news uh, that the three of us are appointed and that gives some continuity and consistency uh, as we move forward. So uh, there's much we've achieved, but much still to do. So um, I think that allows us to um, get on with it. So um, very grateful to the Secretary of State for uh, those three decisions. So um, that's good news. and. Um, I think some of that was being tweeted out yesterday afternoon just to um, let, let people uh, let people know and make that public. So, um, so let's um, get on the right um, agenda. So item two are, are the uh, declarations of interest. Um, I'm not aware of any changes to those declarations, but I'll just pause uh, for a minute. Nicola, you want to come in? On mute, Nicola. I think, David, there was another matter you wanted to address under the welcome um, in relation to the senior independent director. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm I, I, why the Secretary of State renewed me, I haven't got any idea whatsoever, but thank you, Nicola. <laughs> um, uh, you'll know that um, we have not had a senior independent director and as part of our board development uh, we've had a conversation about how we take that forward so i wrote round and asked non-executive directors if there were any colleagues interested in taking on that role and both uh, andrew foster and john latham expressed an interest in taking on the role so rather than run a competition which seemed to be not the appropriate thing to do um, I suggested and it was accepted that um, Andrew Foster should on alphabetical order based on surname should take on the role from the 1st of October this year for 12 months and then that John Latham should take on the role from the 1st of October 2022 for 12 months and then we'll review. Uh, um, it may well be Nicola, uh, I couldn't quite recall that um, Andrew and John's uh, period of uh, membership of the board uh, may be up during that period of time. And of course, that's all subject to renewal and um, uh, travelling optimistically. Um, I, I would hope that both of those would be renewed as well, certainly on the basis of the um, annual review that I did with uh, all the board members. I, I would hope that that would be the case. Um, but what that means is Andrew Foster will take on the role of senior independent director for 12 months from uh, the 1st of October this year. So we do have um, a senior independent director and um, I'll, I'll follow up with Andrew uh, uh, in respect of um, 
that role and uh, how we take it forward. Uh, and I'm sure other than executive directors will offer their support and advice and help to Andrew as well. So um, again, that's good news. Uh, Andrew, do you want to say anything? Uh, I think the only thing I can say is that it's the first time I've ever done anything by virtue of my alphabetical order. But apart from that, I've got a lot to learn about it and I look forward to speaking to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there we go. I, I thought it was slightly better than tossing a coin personally, but anyway, there we go. So, um, but, but in the interest of absolute transparency, it's good that um, both you and John were interested and that um, you, you both accepted that way forward. So, um, thank you. And, and thanks Cindy for her, her advice on that. So, um, with that, I haven't missed anything else out, Nicola. Can we do the minutes? Okay, let's, <laughs> let's do the minutes. Um, um, no, let's do the declarations of interest. Uh, there have been no changes notified to me. Are, are there any colleagues who want to um, advise of any development since the last time we formally considered this? No. OK, thank you very much indeed then. So if we move on to the minutes of our meeting on the 21st of um, July, um, they looked absolutely fine to me. So I'll go through for accuracy first. Uh, page one, two, three, four, five. I think the last one is six. OK, any matters arising anybody wants to raise that's not on our agenda this morning? No, OK, so uh, Nicola, thank you for that. They uh, they can be approved and um, placed on the record. Um, so committee updates, I know there have been committees. Um, I've, I've managed to get along to a couple of them. So um, audit and risk committee first. Um, John's not here, so um, not quite sure if any of the other colleagues from audit and risk want to uh, make any comments about the meeting that took place. Callum, do you want to say anything? Mm -hmm. it, it seemed a, a business-like meeting with our new internal mm -hmm. auditors and um, I, I, I was able to join this meeting and I thought it was very productive, very positive and um, there's a confirmed work programme that our new internal auditors will take. Yeah. Forward. yeah. That's the, that, that would be the main um, point I'd like to make, I think, that um, yeah, we uh, yeah uh, we're spending a lot of time working with KPMG to help them learn from and think about how best to approach their their work for the year. They've got a quite a tight job to do to to quickly get up to speed, and they haven't been, you know they've really got half a year now to, to deliver the work. But um, the program they've got, I think, is is excellent. Covers a lot of. Um, a lot of the sort of immediate uh, sort of um, developing areas that we need some uh, insight over, but also looking very much going back and using the benefit of their fresh pair of eyes to look at you know our core processes. Uh, and I've actually got a meeting with them later this week to kick off and scope the work around following through our our core business from forming plans to um, contracting planning. And then through to the activity occurring, being measured, being recorded on systems, and then taking all the way through to invoicing, payment, and so forth, which is obviously really important for us to kind of understand that. Really important they understand that. And as I say, I think their fresh pair of eyes would be really be really useful to you to kind of take the opportunity of, of that at the moment um, and, and and allow them give them um, as much free reign as possible to, to comment on on how we compare to others and areas that we can improve. So um, yeah, we've got a good plan, but we're going to keep it flexible because they, you know, they they're they're learning about us, and we need to give them the opportunity in six months to kind of think about what they've learned about our organisation and perhaps sort of perhaps re steer the work into new areas that they think are, are going to be important for us. And I think it's important that they have that that independent um, ability to 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 take the work where they think where they think it matters as well as where we, we think it matters. So I'm really encouraged. It's 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 actually a great opportunity to say to have a, a, a new firm um, supporting us. We've had uh, some great uh, input from PwC over the years, but now we've got a new firm again. We're just going to make the most of that.
Thanks, Callum. Just to emphasise that point, I mean, at PwC, I think for the best part of 10 years as our internal auditors, that change in contract to KPMG gives that um, renewed sense of independence from our internal audit function. And that, I think, is uh, helpful uh, as we move forward. So um, thank you for that. So um, the uh, Performance and Business Committee, I know has met, and Andrew George, do you want to um, give us an update on the work that you've been taking forward with your colleagues, Andrew, please? Thank, thank you, David. Um, yes, we met on the 6th of September. Um, we spent a certain amount of time um, reviewing business, and particularly the COVID training disruption plan, um, where, um, as, as we will see later on in this meeting, um, there's been a lot of work done um, to prevent disruption of COVID. And actually, at the moment, it looks as though the financial hit as a result of that uh, is considerably less than the first um, estimate um, that we um, that, that we had. However, there is still some risk in that situation because some of the costs have been actually really transferred to the hospitals uh, and um, if they don't pay it. So, so there is some risk in that one, but the situation is a lot better than perhaps it was. We also discussed the uh, regional improvement fora or forums, um, which um, uh, have started now, uh, led by um, led by David, uh, and the uh, first round there have been teams from both the centre, if you like, and from the region. We spent most of our time talking about how we are going to do business going forward, especially with the broadening of the remit of the committee uh, and the change of name to the Performance and Business Committee. Uh, we talked a lot about the realignment um, of the cycle of the reporting cycle. Um, I think this is still very much work in progress. Uh, we need to further map some of the processes, some of the data points, and so we can get that absolutely right. Um, I think that's all doable, but it's a four-dimensional Rubik's Cube that uh, the executive are having to deal with to get everything aligned. Um, and we had a good discussion about that one. We also had a long discussion about the broadening of our responsibilities under the being the best board that we can. Um, and um, I, I, and I won't rehearse all of that discussion, but I think there was a lot on trying to us to understand the boundaries between us and between other committees um, and so that we didn't overlap when it comes to the board assurance framework and thinking about how we might best do that one. The way forward that we are going to take on this one was that we were agreed that there's some of the material that is, if you like, bang within our remit and that we're going to deal with and postgraduate education is perhaps the front one of that one. And so we're going to have some committee workshops to actually address some of these, if you like, it was non-contentious issues. So we simply get used to, to doing the business that way um, and develop our expertise and our ways of working in that direction. Thank you. No, thank you, Andrew. Um, really helpful. And. Um, a people and culture committee uh, Andrew, Andrew Foster, please. Uh, well we also met on the 6th of September so some people must have had a very busy day that day um, uh, I think it's probably fair to say that this was um, part of a transition process and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment but we received an update on the workforce dashboard which is a collection of metrics which will eventually be reported to the board so I think that will be of, of interest to you all we also um, acknowledge the wider BAF and also the particular parts of the BAF that particularly relate to people and culture. So those were sort of approved by the committee. We, we then took a, a series of, of updates and, and there is a lot going on in terms of people and culture. So the, the best place to work program, which has been going for a while now, gave us an update. But then there is another program looking at the future of work. Um, the KPMG have been engaged to do um, a, a survey into issues of culture within the organisation and we're about to get the results of the, the first staff survey that's been conducted for, for two years. So, so there's, a, there's an awful lot of inputs there uh, and of course we received the news, which, which you all know, that a new Director of People and Culture has been appointed, Vicky Matthews. And I think the next stage is to move from all of these inputs into an output. Um, so it's turning all of this research into um, an overall strategy for people and culture uh, and then action plans in the key areas, uh, particularly equality and diversity, where we have um, 
been intending for a while to to build on the 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 targets that were set horrible word target but targets that were set by the executive for evening up the um representation of bme groups at every level of seniority within he as part of the aspiration of he to be um, the best possible alb when it comes to equality and diversity and i and i know that navina is going to touch on the same issue when it comes to her report so I'll, I'll try not to duplicate that so the the only other thing to report is that recognizing that there is so much going on uh, we've confirmed now that the people committee will meet six times a year rather than four times a year and that's it for me no uh, very good um i think that's um all, all three committees making really uh, positive and constructive pro progress so that's um very pleased to see and I think your point that you um, made at the end Andrew about how we move from assessment into delivery and um, uh, from inputs to outputs um, and outcomes actually uh, I think is absolutely appropriate for this next phase in our development so um, thank you all, all three of you for that. Um, I um, not having a good morning i glossed over the uh, agenda planner which picks up on a number of the things that um uh, have been referred to in terms of agenda items but also in terms of increased frequency of, of, of meetings as well but is there anything um first anything anybody wants to come back to uh from the three chairs any questions comments observations from uh, I, I think every um exec and non-executive uh, board member is a member of one at least of those committees so um, you've all got uh, an engagement and an interest in that are there any comments anybody wants to make in addition no oh we're good okay and just on the agenda planner uh, anything you want to draw attention to nicola from your point of view as board secretary um just to highlight david for members that we've started progressing the actions agreed in our july workshop so from this month the board begins to meet in public every other month um and in a workshop form the months in between and from january we're commencing the committees meeting every six months when the board doesn't meet in public so those dates are starting to come through now and be populated on the agenda planner is that committees every six months did you say no every other month so six yeah. a year yeah okay thank you uh, I, it's good to see that working its way through so thanks for doing that nicola um okay so let's move on now to navina to your report and as uh, andrew has already prefaced some uh, important content to this as well so uh, navina over to you please thank you very much um, so you will have received my report with the papers um, and the report covers the following areas, nursing education reform update, the GMC national training survey, uh, advanced dental care report. Um, and um, David and I have discussed that we will be putting in our forward planner a focus on oral health care and HEE's role uh, for a, a longer discussion in a future board. Um, this update on the status of the spending review uh, discussions, uh, update on the health and care bill, and also our HEE's proposed uh, approach to becoming an anti-racist organisation. Um, I will just pick a few of the topics to expand further, and I want to start by um, just saying on behalf of the executive team, we are all really delighted um, to and welcome the reappointment of Sir David, uh, Andrew George and Liz Mir to our board. Um, we really want to thank you for all the support that you've given us and the challenge and uh, helping us to uh, really push the organisation to the next level. So really pleased about that. Um, we, and I personally um, have really valued your support during my first year, coming up to a year. Um, so thank you from a personal perspective as well. Uh, also, since the report, I want to just uh, mention that we have been, the board will be aware of last week's reshuffle of cabinet and the wider ministerial team, um, and there have been changes uh, at the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, and so uh, we are very, uh, we are keeping up to date and welcome and are really pleased that um, Ed Arger um, has been 
uh, it will be working on workforce and we have worked with him before and also is continuing to progress the health and care bill as it passes through Parliament. Uh, also really pleased to welcome uh, the, to the ministerial team Gillian Keegan and Maggie Thrupp um, and Maria Caulfield um, and uh, Lord Kamal. Um, and we are really look, uh, starting to make plans to work closely with them all to make sure they understand HEE's mandate objectives, our programmes of work, um, and that we deliver their vision and their ambition as well. Um, I'll move on to the spending review uh, right now. Um, the board is aware that of the funding announcement that was made earlier this month by government, um, the details are yet to be clarified, but we are working very closely together with the department and with our colleagues in NHS England and improvement to make sure that um, that the position of HEE and how we contribute to delivering the ambitions and the uh, priorities for the NHS continues in our trilateral approach, which has been working really well so far. Um, so we are working through the detail. We'll keep the board informed. Uh, but it's really important to recognise that we have a different opportunity right now as a result of a multi-year horizon and we have some months to collaborate to collaborate on the plan for how we meet the challenges across service uh, finance and workforce planning in the short, medium and a longer term. Um, if I can mention um, that in the for the health and care bill uh, this month, earlier this month, I attended the first session of the bill committee to give evidence and I was joined by Danny Mortimer for NHS em employers. Um, personally felt that it was a, a good session and we managed to get across the to the bill committee uh, that HEE's commitment to um, working to advance the uh, priorities in the bill with regards to workforce planning. If I may move on to the GMC survey, uh, the background is in my written report. Um, quality of education and training and the experience of our learners and trainees is absolutely central to our work. So I wanted to briefly mention it again. Um, this survey is a really important piece of intelligence for us. We always pay very close attention to the outputs and make sure that it resonates with what we already know and we triangulate with information from elsewhere. Um, so there are positive aspects to the report um, where the trainees 76% rating the quality of teaching as good or very good. Um, and we also picking up some of the concerns that uh, trainees have raised with reports of feeling uh, burnout, which has increased to 33%. Um, all of our deans are aware of the survey results. Our deans also have their own um, uh, information, uh, both locally and from the National Education and Training Survey. Um, and we are uh, very happy that the, and satisfied with the plans that our deans have and the good relationships they have to improve on the areas of concern. Uh, very quickly, just want to mention the HEE operating model, um, which uh, we brought to the July board. Um, and board requested that we start working out our draft principles as soon as possible. So we will have these in place from October with a framework setting out our relationships with ICSs. Um, and we've been testing some of these elements in the last month or so together with regions and um, other parts of our business. Um, so what, what matters for me is that this operating model really resonates with our people. So every single one of us understands what this means to us and how our work fits in uh, as things change in systems so that we are truly responsive to what's required uh, in the systems for, and providers. Uh, so we started a lot of activity internally to socialize this work uh, and we'll continue to keep an eye on making sure that it's really meaningful. Um, I now want to move on to um, uh, giving the board some information about our commitment to towards working and uh, for HEE to become an anti-racist organisation. We've been talking quite a lot about how important uh, looking after our people is, both our people within HEE, but also our business, which is all about people, learners, trainers, students, and also our influence. And it is impossible to look after our people if we don't think about um, equality, diversity and inclusion. It's a big part of many areas for improvement. 
Um, and also, we have to make sure there is a thread that runs through about certain individuals being more disadvantaged than others. Um, and that's not just within our organization, but actually in all of our business. So um, one of the, the we have recently been working with our partners in NHSE and I and um, with our trust and providers. And we note that many of the organizations we work with are taking some bold steps to uh, towards becoming anti-racist organizations. So moving from race equality to actually actively uh, working to eliminate, reduce uh, racism in our systems, individual, structural, systemic. Um, and we realize that our potential, uh, if we are to work with organizations to help and support them in this work, we ourselves need to look at our own, um, how, we, how we function as HEE. Um, so we have thought about the timing of this, and we feel that it is important for us at board level in public to state that we want to work towards this, that there are many areas for improvement in HEE, how we function, how we work with one another, how we treat one another. And in order for us to support others, we must look at our own house, get our own house in order. So what we're doing is we are going to work to produce a plan. This is not easy. Um, it is not comfortable. Uh, and it cannot be done overnight. You can't just make a declaration and then think that the work is done. It's actually hard work. Um, and we need to bring all of our people within HEE, our faculty beyond HEE, and our partners with us on this journey. Um, so we will be taking a plan to the People Committee, uh, People and Culture Committee, to uh, work out the milestones for us as an organization and how we influence and support others uh, in this work. We know that focusing on race equality will have really beneficial effects for all of our EDI work. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you, Naveen. And um, a very comprehensive re report, very, very, um, very, very clear. And I have to say, incredibly well written as well, uh, Naveen, as well. Uh, what I think is important, Naveen and I uh, um, had, um, have had a number of discussions around uh, an approach to uh, anti-racism and our statement of our ambition. And um, I hope we can consider this because I think it's important that as a board we support this. This is the board's responsibility, it strikes me, not Naveena's. And I think we need to actually share um, the... I, I think the duty we've got, but the responsibility we've got uh, uh, in this respect. So um, if I could open up the conversation um, very much with that uh, in mind. Um, Liz, I think you you were first and then I'll, Soraya, I'll come to you. So Liz, please. Yeah, thanks, Sir David. And thank you, Naveena. Really clear, positive paper. And thank you to all colleagues. I think the papers today, the great, the clear, we set out what you're asking us to do, but they're really good. So thank you ever so much. So, so absolutely agree with the anti-racist, uh, HE signing up to be an anti-racist organisation. Uh, one of my questions was, I was going to ask was, what, what does that mean? But I think you've explained that really well, Naveena. And it'd be great to see the action plan coming to the People and Culture Committee where we can have a think about that a bit more and how we take definite action uh, as an organisation. Um, the other thing that I was going to pick up um, was the health and care bill and its commitment right across the piece, not just sort of looking at health, but looking at social care and how we work with those colleagues. So that's I think we've talked to this board about that's how we're going to make a difference to residents by working together. And then my one, um, it's sort of a comment and a question. Uh, the nursing education reform update. Um, there's a, there's a little bit of detail there about flexible careers, including careers in research and education. And for nursing, that just seems so important at the moment. We've got some great staff there. They often don't get the chance to get involved in research or, or you know, it's timed out of their uh, the, the day job. So it'd be really good just it, not not here because we might not have the detail here, but to think about how we do encourage nurses to go into research or have research as part of the day jobs. Raya, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I think Naveen, uh, to David, uh, to both of you, thank you um, for actually bringing this um, so openly. And I think the honesty that um, uh, this ALB can show 
in terms of the EDI agenda and the fact that we want to move forward and make positive inroads, I think is going to be welcomed not only, I think, by our own staff, but I think also within the system, um, because I think every organisation um, is on a journey, but actually to be far more honest about this and work with um, people is absolutely critical at this stage. And it's a real opportunity. I think the last sort of 18 months, two years, um, has really uh, pushed a momentum forward um, on the agenda. So really great. Um, I hope actually our ALB um, network of NEDS can also actually help this because they'll be sharing across the organisations. And the fact we've also, um, through Sir David's link with Dal Babu and the provider non-exec um, network, I think that's really going to be uh, quite powerful for us to share what we're doing and, and hopefully spread that. So great news there. Um, can I just pick up one question around um, the surveys? And I think it's really encouraging to see the survey with trainees. But as we move forward to winter pressures and some of the unknowns in the next sort of three to six months, um, how are we actually supporting some of our tutors and trainers? I think there's a real sense in the system that people are um, not just exhausted, but there's this big backlog and the restart. And I know we're going to discuss this later on, but it'd be really helpful to understand if we're doing anything to support tutors and trainers in the system. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Let, let Andrew come in, um, Navina, and um, can I just explain? I, I can't get my chat function up. It keeps telling me it's trying to refresh it. But um, uh, so if you need to uh, get a message to me, um, you'll have to wave at me or something. The chat is not working. Uh, I will call you, Mark, on the nursing point, uh, just to, um, because they flash past, but they don't uh, they don't sit anywhere. But um, sorry, my um, uh, to intrude again. But Andrew George, please. Thank you. Um, so first of all, on the um, anti-racist agenda, um, you know, 110% um, um, support this. I think my comment is that when we produce the plan, we need to be very clear what the remit is. Um, and I think you, Navina, sort of said the remit, and I think the remit's got to be ourselves. Um, this can't be about virtue signalling to the outside world that we are a clever organisation that's thought about this. It's got to be about ourselves. Rather, uh, but, but it's actually quite important to limit it, you know, to, to bound it so that we don't take on the whole world and try and eat an elephant. We, we ought to try and reform ourselves. So I guess that's the my comment on that. We really welcome it, but we just need to be very clear what we're trying to do uh, in it and, and, and have that very clear focus. Um, I was going to, but I was um, asked questions about the dental programme. But I think, Navina, you say we're going to have a, a workshop on the oral health. I'd really welcome that because I must admit, I, it's an area I probably don't understand as well as I should understand. I got a little bit lost in the acronyms. Um, so if, if, if I, I, I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, anybody else want to come in on, on this? Um, uh, Mark, do you want to come in on nursing before I ask Navina to sweep it all in? I thought um, I thought the pithiness of the agenda around nursing was really welcome. Um, I, I did something for the Midlands chairs yesterday and used it, and it really does have a, a resonance, I think, because it is so pithy, it is so practical, and it is um, a really practical uh, demonstration of what reform to the nursing education actually means. It, it, it's beyond the rhetoric of what it means, so uh, particularly welcome. But um, this is a work that you're leading on, Mark. Just um, uh, the floor is yours for uh, uh, an explanation. Thanks. Thanks, Sir David. And, and Liz makes a really, really important point. Actually, bringing those two issues together around our stance on anti-racism and also aspects of how we do our business, particularly in relation to reform, I think are fundamentally linked. We have many, many examples, uh, both in, in all professions, where the issue of diversity uh, materially affects people's experience, either as a learner or a trainee, or their ability to progress in their careers. You know, so we have got many examples, um, including issues around gender, race, and also other protected characteristics, where, um, as an example, um, uh, men in nursing, um, there are far more 
uh, men in more senior positions in nursing than there are as a as a all, all female graduate profession. And we see similar issues and challenges within the university sector where career progression for those from a black and minority ethnic background um, are, are less than their white colleagues. Uh, so th they are intrinsically linked around um, maximising the opportunity and the potential, reflecting the community of learners and trainees that we have within our systems of health and social care. And also importantly, what HEE can do with partners to address some of those issues, to move forward the reform agenda and also deal with some of the um, historical structural challenges that exist for many participants within our profession. Um, so we're working actively with national partners around reform and opportunity, particularly with the university sector, Universities UK, uh, Council of Deans on areas where we can work. So a good example of that is uh, we started a piece of work around how do we invest and develop the, the resources that HEE applied to, to placements, as an example, to improve a career opportunity for those coming into practice education and teaching who then might go on to with appropriate support in terms of a, um, an academic career. And we started that piece of work with, with Council of Deans. Um, but there are other areas where widening out participation and opportunity is fundamentally important. So um, we're pleased that we've been we've been doing a lot of work around the apprentice agenda around, as an example, those who've come into nursing associate programmes. We've had such great interest in those wanting to go on to uh, registered nursing. But actually, what we need to do is make sure that, that process is easy. Um, it, it's high quality, as we would expect, but also maximises the learning opportunities people may bring in from different parts of that. So again, doing work around um, accreditation to prior learning is a really important part of that and something we've been discussing with, with the Nursing Midwifery Council. And the final part is around um, learning from international partners. So with Patrick's team, we've had a series of round tables with international partners, most recently with the University uh, Hospital San Francisco um, and University Hospital Associations of California, looking at the, the opportunities that they have in relation to things as an example, simulation was our recent discussion. And I had the privilege of speaking to this wonderful student from uh, postgraduate student from University of San Francisco, California, talking about how simulation provided her with the opportunity to to consolidate her learning in practice, but also to kind of reflect upon what she had learned during their programme. So it was a real adjunct to really high quality outputs and teachings. So again, all of this work that we're convening across the system is being fed into this reform programme. But but one of the things is we're really cited on is, is, is importantly addressing some of these structural issues that we see and exist within both education and training, but also our role and responsibility for future development and provision of um, our, our course programme. Uh, wonderful. Um, I think it's a really great agenda, Mark, so thank you for that. Um, so, uh, Andrew, is yours a new or an old hand? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a new comment on Mark's, if I might. Yes, please. Um, I'll be, try and be brief. Uh, just personal reflection, because as uh, I'm being uh, um, reverse mentored in another organisation, an NHS organisation, and what it's opened my eyes slightly to is that you talk very w rightly, Mark, about progression and entrance and movement through the nursing hierarchy. There's also a horizontal movement that's sometimes needed between types of nursing. And so the person I'm reverse mentoring um, is uh, black and works in a part of the hospital where all of the nurses are black. Um, and um, people from a white background pass through it on their way upwards. Uh, their other parts are not. So in other words, it's actually quite siloed and they see themselves as a group who are doing a hard frontline job that nobody else wants them to do. Um, and therefore, you know, th therefore they come contained. So I think we also don't, we need to think about the horizontal movement as well as the vertical movement, because I, you know, I can't believe that's healthy. And uh, talking to her and some of her colleagues whom I met, this is repeated across the country. This isn't a one off. And I hadn't fully realised that. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Yes, uh, we link in with um, obviously the Chief Nursing Officer, Ruth May, has the National CNO uh, BME Advisory Group and actually HEE teams both nationally and regionally link into those to explore all, all opportunities in terms of support and understanding of some of those issues and challenges. But that uh, perhaps offline, I, I'll, I'll be 
great to learn more about what you what you've discovered and also maybe connect with those individuals as well to to understand Andrew I think um, I think your point highlights why we've stated an ambition to become anti-racist rather than claim to be anti-racist because this is so difficult at its heart uh, this is really a um, a fundamental review of the culture of the organisation. I think you're right to say we must concentrate on what we are responsible for. But I think your very question just talks about the lived experience of people and how difficult uh, and how challenging that's going to be as well uh, within the organisation. Uh, and, and that's, uh, I think, why uh, Navina is quite properly positioning this as a statement of ambition rather than as a claim that we've got somewhere. I think we need some humility uh, as we address this agenda and um, that's what we're uh, hoping we can do through this work. Naveena, last last yeah. word to you on all of this. Um, well, I just really want to thank uh, the board for your support on what I think is going to be um, uh, uh, uncomfortable, uh, but and really important. I can't see how we can be effective if we don't tackle uh, the issue of equality and disadvantage and racism. And so, thank you for that. Um, I I think actually, uh, Sir David, if I may ask, I know that there's quite a lot of work going on to support educators and trainers, and it'd be good for um, public board to hear a little bit about what we're doing. Perhaps can I ask Shona to just just give you a flavour so that you have some assurance about about this matter. Trina, can you do that, please? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'll do it quickly. Um, we've very much been working with our partners in I&E &E, um, and across the system. So working with different directorates, the Transformation Directorate, working with the Recovery, working with Celia and Steve Powers' team to emphasise that it's training recovery needs trainer time has been one of our key messages. So we have been sending messages out every two weeks across the system, emphasising the need for trainer time. We have um, got agreed funding um, through Callum discussing with the DH to support trainees, but some of that is being used to support educators to allow them to have more competencies in especially dealing with the well-being issues. So there is a widespread recognition that it's not just our trainees that have been severely affected, it's the trainers who, some of whom are on their knees from trying to deliver clinical work. And although we said they could prioritise clinical work over education, of course, none of them dropped education. They did it in the wee small hours between two and four and are, are understandably tired. But um, one of the great things about education is it motivates people, it makes them enthusiastic and they have kept going. But we're very aware of that. Also working with NAC, the National Association of Clinical Tutors and the Academy. We have regular catch ups with the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and all their education leads on what we can do to support trainers and what extra resources there are. And of course, we're working with the GMC who do survey trainers and are concerned about the burnout that they see in them. So it's it's something we're very aware of. We don't have the answer to the problem, but I think by everybody being focused on the fact that it is a problem and especially working with E and I, we can um, make a difference to how people prioritise education time. Very good. Thanks, Shona. Um, I visited Worcestershire Acute Trust last week and uh, what was really interesting is the commitment from Matthew Hopkins and the senior team there to continue in education in spite of the pressures they've been through. They've maintained both their training for doctors and nurses as a priority and have actually run that alongside and I, I think feel more confident about the future because they've done that rather than actually uh, compromised along the way. So it was very, very interesting just to get that view from the staff that work in that organisation about how that work has uh, been prioritised. So uh, really important as um, uh, as we go into this autumn and then into the winter period that um, that principle is um, is one that is shared pretty broadly across the system. So yeah, thanks Sean. Okay, I'm going to move on if I may. Um, so thank you for that, uh, Naveena. So let's go to item eight, uh, which is the strategic framework. And um, um, 
Uh, who's going to lead us through this? Is it? Um... Sure. It's, my, it's myself, but um, I thought was it was not best place to work next. What am I doing? Am I in the wrong? I oh goodness me! I'm not having a good morning, am I? Uh, thank you, Joe. It is the best yeah. place to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh dear me, Lee, are you doing this? <laughs> I am indeed, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody else want to chair for the morning? <laughs> All right, come on, let's do it. <laughs> Uh, so thank you colleagues. Um, I hope you've had a chance to look at the paper so I won't go through it in anything remotely resembling detail. Um, just pick out a few bits. So this is um, represented for about 18 months now into our Best Place to Work programme um, and it was a three-year programme that we set out in response to the We Are HG reports um, in a sort of early last year which obviously were reflective of this board's desire of HG to become the best place to work. So what, what this paper does is it gives you an update on what we've done to date, um, some of the results of the work we've done to date, but I think more importantly perhaps it talks about how we're integrating the best place to work programme with a number of other programmes that are about making HE the best organisation it can be to deliver the things that we're talking about in uh, Navina's report and that Sheldon talked about in supporting educators and Mark talked about in supporting um, nursing reform, etc. So it, it's about how we make the organisation as fit as it can be to deliver all the things that um, we all want to deliver. So we're talking here about uh, both the Best Place to Work programme and the 46 recommendations and the work that's been ongoing to deliver that. We also talk about digital first, and I noticed that James is um, on the in the meeting um, who is leading the digital first program, which is all about how we use technology better, but also how we help people uh, pro do things better in terms of processes and engagement with the technology um, across the organisation. Um, Andrew's already talked about the future of work that we um, inputs that we've got from people are talking about how they want to work in the future. And obviously, Navina's talked about the operating model as well. So we're bringing those four bits of work together um, under a, a single sort of oversight um, governance process um, with uh, myself, Navina, David and Patrick, um, who are the directors who lead each of those bits of work so we can make sure that alignment um, delivers effectively across the organisation. Um, so what you will see in the paper um, is a um, outline of how we're going to do that governance and how that committee is going to work. Um, some updates on what we've actually delivered on best place to work and some of the things we're working on at the moment. Um, some of the facts and figures about what we learnt about future of work um, and how we're taking that work forward through um, three different, different areas around people, around estates and around digital. Again, making the link between best place to work and digital first. Also, we talk about the annual survey. We haven't been able to analyse all the results yet. And as you'll see, there's a huge amount of data to analyse. But I just want to share with the board some thoughts about um, how the, the survey will help us do the work I've talked about. So the survey, yes, it's the first one we've done for two or three years. We made sure it's as comparable as possible to what we did last time. So we can show changes over that period. Equally, equally, we've reflected some of the changes around res and disability equality standards to make sure some of those questions were in the survey. So we'll be able to report on some of the stuff that again Andrew was talking about in the Portland People Committee. Uh, equally, there's a new NHS staff survey going out this year that is updated from the previous one. And we've got some of those questions into this. So we'll have data going forward. We can compare also against NHS staff survey. And as soon as we get the fuller results of that, we will share it with um, People Committee, People and Culture Committee as part of um, the new arrangements around um, how we report this stuff. But just to pick up finally on something that um, we just talked about, that Shona talked about, about supporting faculty educators. Um, as both, in both the Future Work Survey and the Best Place to Work Survey, we included that group of colleagues within the surveys. And as you can see from the paper, the, the response rates were far lower than those from wholly employed colleagues. 
which is perhaps not a surprise at all, considering what they were focusing on at the time, as Shona's just outlined, and also the different nature of our relationship with them and how they work with us and how they work differently with us and their relationship with their own trusts, for instance, who will also be doing a staff survey. Um, but what that has led us to do in our new conversations that happening across the organisation already with colleagues in um, the education teams is how do we best have the relationship with these people moving forward that allows them to get the support they need from us, for us to make sure we're getting the best out of them for the educate for the, themselves, their trust, but also the learners. We um, ask them to support us delivering education and training for. So there's a, a bit of work going to be done um, across the organisation to try and have a further conversation with this group of people on their own terms about how we best work together moving forward to make sure they are in the right place in their relationship with HEE. Um, so hopefully, uh, so David, that gives you an overview of best place to work, but also some other bits of information the board may find interesting. Um, Lee, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll call in others. I've got some comments to make, but I'll, I'll keep those to the end and if they've already been made by other colleagues I don't need to make them but um, Liz Mears said what a good set of papers uh, they were. Um, when I read this at the weekend I uh, wrote um, this is a very good paper for both length and clarity. I think it's uh, I think this is the benchmark of what a paper to the board should look like Lee and uh, colleagues. Um, I think it's it's pithy. Um, it tells us everything we need to know and um, uh, the length is a good one in, in terms of setting the discussion. So uh, just uh, because we've had that discussion and I've had comments on these uh, matters before, uh, it's absolutely appropriate. We just say um, this is a really good paper. So thank you and well done, Lee. Um, it provokes a range of issues and the hands that are showing um, uh, demonstrate the appetite for that. So I think um, uh, Andrew uh, Foster was um, was first to um, raise his hand. So, Andrew, over to you. Uh, so, first of all, I, I agree with what you just said, uh, David, about the quality of the paper, but also about the quality of the work. You know, there isn't an organisation in the country that doesn't go around saying things like our staff are our greatest asset, but not so many of those can translate that into specific action. And here you have, you know, one sentence each, 10 specific actions that AGE has done to to make it a best place to work. So I, I really do commend the, the, you know, the specific focus of action on that. 70% to 7%, depending on who the audience is and what the subject is. Um, I, I think the people plan, which came out um, was it last year or this year, I can't remember, last year, I think it was in the end, makes the point that to do best practice in, in surveys is to have a, a regular three monthly pulse check because a 12 monthly survey uh, or in this case a three yearly survey is really too remote to know what's actually happening in the organization so despite the apparently low survey results from some of the surveys i do hope that we can move to a quarterly pulse check which will give us a much sort of you know, on the, well, as it's called, on the pulse of, of what's going on in the organisation. And we, we almost need a separate way of approaching the, the faculty type of staff who have got the low response rates. But but overall, you know, this is brilliant stuff and well done to Lee and everybody else. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Liz? Yeah, thanks, David. And great to see this paper. We all want HE to be, best, to be the best place to work for everybody that works with us or, or for us in any sort of capacity. So so my question was about the focus groups because good response rate to the survey, we could do better, but it is good, 70%. And and who how do we select people for those focus groups? And I'm I'm sort of asking this because I've had a discussion last week with my Freedom to Speak Up Guardian Ned role about how we engage people and through different channels. And when I read this I just thought how we have we got all different types of staff, all different types of people represented on the focus groups. Really good point. Um, Soraya. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, an excellent paper. And I think it's so good to see how the three bits of the initiative are all going to blend in together. And um, just really a question of how we're feeding this back to staff, um, because other organisations I'm involved in, you know, there's lots of discussions, there's differences how different teams and managers are going to apply some of what they're 
thinking is um so how is that going to be fed back and um how are we going to sort of pick up on any issues that different managers might be different approaches thanks um sorry andrew george please Thank you, uh, and I like you everything, but won't spend time echoing it. That's been said already about, about this. I wanted to ask Lee about um, the first paragraph in the report summary. When we started this off, we did it because it was predicated. I mean, one, I think we did it the right thing to do, but we also did it because predicated on the evidence that happy, talented, engaged, and support staff deliver better outcomes, etc. And I guess how are we monitoring that? And I'm not asking because I think that. I, I doubt the link. I, I, I believe in that link, uh, but it's actually if we can demonstrate that link to some of our other NHS organisations, then we can be a force for good um, as well across the NHS. Thank you. Uh, one of the key questions, I think, Andrew. Thank you. Um, Harpreet. Thank you, Sir David. Um, Lee, again, great paper and, and excellent work on this. This was just picking up on the well-being aspect of things. I'd read you know, one of the notes that well-being had dropped for about a fifth of our workforce and also the rise in mental health was was significant throughout the pandemic and I know we've had a number of interventions throughout the pandemic but are we planning to continue those in the foreseeable future so that we can potentially help colleagues get through this I just wanted to get a sense of that please thank you very good Harpreet. thank you Andrew Morris thanks David um, great paper um, my only thought on this is um, um, around how, how can we share this good work with other ALBs? Because um, I know NHSE and I are doing a lot of work on this. And it may be, Lee, you know, you spend a bit of time with one of Prainer's team um, and we get the best from both, both sets of organisations going forward. But it's a fantastic piece of work. So well done. This is really good stuff. Thank you. Really good idea. Uh, thanks. Um, Lee, um, I'd echo slightly differently the um, feedback from our Freedom to Speak Up Guardians. I don't think section 9, 10, the discussion element of it made reference to that. And it seems to me that's as that role has developed within the organisation and Simon has developed, you know, the team that are taking that forward and Liz has taken on the role. Then it seems to me that's also an important source of uh, qualitative feedback to sit alongside the quantitative feedback we'll get from the surveys just to just to make the point that is being made. Um, um, I wanted to comment though on um, the uh, um, what, what would called it now uh, the future of work uh, section and um, it's really uh, important that we've asked people what their experiences of uh, working from home have been and what their ambitions are for the future. I, I absolutely get that. Um, but I'd also like to encourage you to think about what are the functions that can be undertaken from home and what are the functions that need to be undertaken in an office rather than how many days people will be at home and how many days will be in the office. Uh, we need to align the business reasons for um, working from home and working from uh, offices or, or workplaces rather than offices, workplaces, I think. Uh, rather than just uh, a number of days. And it, it seems to me that um, I, when I was reading it, I was thinking, OK, so four days, for what? And one day, for what? And um, uh, we just need to be clear about that. Um, because if we're going to take leases on buildings for five days, we need to be clear why we're taking the lease for five days and how that money is being used, et cetera. Um, uh, so I just think there's uh, more work to be done on the analysis of functions when it comes to the issue about the future of work and how we um, can encourage the best work uh, and the most effective work rather than um, just do this division of 20% um, or uh, divide everything by five and then work out where people are going to be for it. It's, it's the functions that are more important in my mind. Uh, but the floor is yours, I think. I think that was all the questions, comments that um, colleagues wanted to make. Brilliant. Uh, thank, thank you, David. And thank you, colleagues, for the feedback on the paper and the work. I will make sure that colleagues who did the actual work um, get that feedback. Um, and I'm sure they'll be delighted um, that the quality of the work they're doing is being recognised. Um, so just go through these 
uh, one by one. So first of all, Andrew and response rates, uh, absolutely, and pulse checks. Um, we have built into our model between now and then the of the year um, at least one other pulse check, if not two, depending on what the results are, but also another We Are HE online discussion is already built into our contract with our suppliers um, to deliver um, a bit more um, of that sort of stuff that you were talking about between now um, and over the next period. And on the faculty staff, absolutely, we need to do that bit of work um, to work out how we best support them, how they best support us, and whether we're having the right conversations with them in the right way. Um, and that's something we're definitely taking forward. So thank you for that, Andrew. Um, in terms of the focus groups, Liz, um, the way it was done was we asked people to, to uh, come forward and say, are you interested? Um, we then split them up into 29 different groups that were representative of um, the business, so different business strands across the organisation. Um, and then we put in an, an EDI filter as well to make sure there was a representative both um, all around race and around um, other protected characteristics as well as um, geography and that sort of thing. So I couldn't hand on my heart say that it was absolutely as um representative as perhaps we would have wanted but it was as representative as we could have got it i think in the in the time we had so those, that was taken into account when we all those together um in terms of feedback to staff soraya um we have done all staff webinars on what we have so far both future of work and also best place to work and um, we've had a whole number of programs um around having access to all the information so all the data that we've got from all these has been open access on our internal systems. So any member of staff who wants to go and look at what the We Are HE reports were, what the feedback from future work was, look at the tables, look at the diagrams, it's all available for colleagues to look at. And personally, but also we've encouraged team leaders and managers to talk to their own teams um, around the work, um, the, the feedback and what it means for their teams. And we'll do the same with the, with the um, response to the colleague survey um, and the colleague survey will help us hopefully Andrew um, get some of the stuff you're talking about in terms of how we monitor um, whether we are delivering happy staff who are engaged and supported as we mentioned at the beginning of the paper but I think you're absolutely right the trick and this is something I'm talking to David about no doubt he's talking to you about is how we um, reflect that in productivity and how we make sure that the measures of where we're, whether we're delivering more and delivering better of higher quality is reflective of our staff feeling happy or engaged and that sort of thing and I think there's still some work to be done on that if I'm frank but I'm sure that but I know those are discussions that are ongoing. Um, absolutely um, Harper there's been some issues with regards to uh, mental health um, and relationships throughout the pandemic. When we ask the questions it's interesting we asked more about COVID itself rather than how we were working and so there were very clear impacts on uh, mental health um, and uh, about and relationships with personal relationships as well um, and we are taking that through through the health and well-being hub more work's been done in that area we are investigating mental health first aid um, and one of the debates we're having actually is what's the best provider from that because there are different um, views from mental health professionals about the most effective way of delivering um, mental health first aid and mental health support for a workforce. So we're testing some of that out through um, our people and culture colleagues. Um, on sharing with other LBs, Andrew, absolutely I know conversations being had through Lisa and the HR team with um, people in i &E, but any more we can do on that, absolutely up for it. Uh, finally, for you, David, two things, freedom to speak up, absolutely really important and getting some feedback we had a uh, all staff webinar last week that um, members freedom speak up guardians and um, Navina um, and Simon all spoke at um, feedback was fantastic in terms of people's knowledge of them and support for them and I know having spoken to them afterwards we had people coming forward saying they wanted to be guardians raising issues they didn't know they could raise through that Issue. So that has happened. And one thing obviously we're talking to Simon about, he does an annual report to the board about issues raised with Freedom to Speak Up, and we're making sure they're reflected in our conversations. But obviously the whole point of Freedom to Speak Up is, is how um, you can be confident that what you tell them will be kept confidential. So there's some discussions we have with Simon about 
what we can talk about, what we can't talk about. Absolutely, the quality of feedback when we can get it is used. In terms of, and I'm sorry, I've been talking for a long time, the final section um, around functions in offices. It's a conversation I'm having with RD and national colleagues at the moment. And I've got emails coming in about what people are doing in offices, um, how, how we assign business need and function to personal choice. And that's absolute core of the work going forward. So hopefully I think that addresses all the questions that were raised. Thanks, Lee. Um, can I just check um, that when we've done the analysis on the staff survey, we'll make that public. It will be published. Um, I, I think as well as being open with staff, it's important uh, we're a transparent organisation and there's been debate about whether all staff surveys are published. And I just think as a matter of principle, ours should be. Uh, I think this should be uh, material that's in the public domain. Thanks for that confirmation. Naveena, last word to you. Yes, may I just um, uh, add again, thanks to everyone for the hard work in this area this last year and a half. We, It's been uphill, um, but it feels really good. Uh, and we've got a long way to go. I want to just add that, um, so in order, now it comes to delivery of the to actions and impact and measurement, and um, everybody in the executive team, all of our functions and our directorates will be involved, uh, coordinated by Lee and David Farrelly uh, as Chief Operating Officer and uh, Vicky Matthews as um, the Director for People and Culture, because a lot of the actions will be uh, spread across uh, all of us to deliver uh, improvements. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I just wanted to reinforce, two questions that we ask everybody to consider in terms of the future of work and um, being in an, in a work office space um, is we've asked people to really think what is an office for um, and be really, you know, whatever you think it is, what is an office for? And the second is, uh, to be really intentional about why and when we want to come together in person, and it's and it'll be really and we are really interested to see um, what people feel, and there'll be variation depending on your team and the nature of your work and everything else. So we're collecting that uh, to help us to inform uh, how we how we uh, use the space. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, so terrific work and I think a big endorsement, uh, Lee. Um, I think all those questions were additional questions rather than uh, any challenge to the direction of travel and the motivation. And uh, I know Andrew Foster and the People and Culture Committee will oversee this. And I think Vicky um, impressed me when I met her, was it last week or the week before, by her enthusiasm, which I thought was uh, infectious as well as terrific. So. Um, uh, we look forward to um, uh, progressing this agenda. It's so, so, so important. Um, the reasons that Andrew George said that we, we know what the evidence is, is that people that feel engaged are more productive. And um, so there's a business reason to do this as well, uh, in my own view, a moral and ethical reason why we should be doing it. So um, uh, this is uh, really good work. So thank you for that. So um, with that, um, uh, if I'm now in the right place on the agenda, I think I am, I hope I am, it's um, if that's uh, the workforce that we've got in the organisation, uh, Joe, if you lead us through the conversation about what do we want that workforce to be doing over this year, next year and the years beyond. So, uh, Joe, over to you, please. Great. Thanks, David. And thanks, opportunity to update the board and our strategic framework. Um, just just to, to flag that we've got a special workshop next month for the board where we can spend a lot more time on the actual content and and some of the choices and issues arising from the research that we're doing. But today I wanted to sort of just give you an outline of the process. And if it's not too grand a word, the philosophy that underpins it, because this isn't just a report that, that we're producing. The way in which we, we hope to develop the work is as important as, as, as the output um, itself. Uh, and so first of all, just a quick reminder why we're doing this. I think as David just said, the workforce supports delivery without the workforce. We don't we don't really have um, a health service and we need a supply strategy for the short and the medium and the long term. So we are working with the E&I absolutely on how we get uh, as, as, as much workforce for, for this winter 
and beyond. But because our specific remit is to spend public money on the education training of the future workforce, we are probably the only part of the system that has to pay particular attention to that long term agenda. Because from, from end to end, it can take 15 years to train a consultant. Uh, and why that matters is because w within those investments, when we commission X number of places for X number of, of, of ologists or cl clinicians, we are making assumptions about the nature of that future, about the impact of technology, about the impact of dem demography on, on demand and supply. And the issue I think that we have now, is, as we discussed before, is that lots of different people have lots of different assumptions um, about, about the future. And the point of us doing this framework is to work with the system so we can develop a common set of assumptions, which may or may will have degrees of accuracy, but a shared set of planning assumptions that can underpin the, the public investments that we make in the future. So we've got the best chance of meeting the future need of patients and indeed of our workforce, um, because those two go uh, hand in hand. So the more we understand those key drives of change, we can then uh, create, um, as you say, a, a framework that uh, has some common variables, assumptions, that is then the prerequisite for more detailed workforce plans for each profession, each pathway, or each regional place. So it's not instead of, it's, it's a well as and alongside, and we will work backwards and forwards within the different timescales uh, and with regions and national colleagues as, as we do that. So I think I'd say is that we're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. We did a framework 15, um, in 2014, the difference is that, that it was a HEE view, it was an NHS view. This, this is looking at the health and social care system and we're doing it as a trilateral, so working in partnership with the department and also E&I colleagues and skills for care. And, and, and that is really at the heart of our process. We want to develop in conversation with the system, not as a discrete research project that we then just produce and um, uh, publish to the system. So if I can, I just want to share one slide which is highlighted um, within the report. Who said? I've got it here. Just because again, this then summarizes, gives, gives an overview. Can you see this slide? I can't see if it was nodding. Can someone tell me if you can see a slide? No. no. You can't? No. OK, so just try that one more time. Can you see a slide now? It's on the way. Yes. Yeah. Ah, jolly good, thank you. So this is the um, what we call the funnel slide. This is an overview of the elements that we've included in the paper, which essentially so we're going to start very, very broad. So at the moment, we've taken, uh, we've done our own desktop review, obviously, of what we currently think we know within HEE. We've made a call for evidence, which we, we brought to the board before. So, uh, so um, asking all partners, professional, um, informal, charitable, pu public, private, um, to respond to a survey that broke down, um, that asked people what they thought the impact of different drives of change, like technology, demographics, disease, would be on both demand and supply. And we've commissioned an independent organisation, and I'm delighted to say the contract was awarded to Grant Thornton, and they're now currently doing that evidence. And as we highlight in the paper, we've had over 311, I think it's 311 now, um, submissions to that, sort of broadly half organisations, half individuals. We've got some initial data on how that breaks down, which we can talk about but we'll do, we'll do much more detailed work to make sure we're reaching all parts of the system uh, that we need to. So we'll have some quantitative and qualitative information um, from that. But also in, but all, all of our regions are discussing the, the same issues with their regional people boards. We've got um, our social care colleagues led by Skills for Care. They've been having SIPs. Uh, workshops with the social care sector uh, to go alongside that call for evidence to make sure that we're fully engaged and framing the conversation in that way. We'll have a series of deep dives and round tables, both involving what we call internal, uh, internal uh, leaders, if you like our usual suspects, but also our external challenge. So making sure that we've got um, a table of experts that Sir David will chair actually, involving people from outside 
uh, England, from outside the NHS sector, from outside uh, our usual generational uh, demographic frame to make sure we're really challenging ourselves and not getting into groupthink as we progress through that. And then we've got a series of what we call deliberative um, events that we've commissioned NHS Horizons led by Helen Bevan to lead. Uh, our first is on November the 1st, then December the 9th and February the 9th, uh, where we start to bring all this information together. And it'll be a virtual event involving at least 300 people. Invites went out um, uh, last week, which hopefully you've seen. And together, through what's called a dialogic dialogical process, we will start to sift and filter the, the sort of key emerging findings and the issues and choices that that presents us with as a system to see uh, where we can identify areas of agreement and consensus where possible. And sometimes we just won't. There'll be areas of difference or uncertainty. But again, naming those that by the end of this process will be iterative and ongoing. Uh, April 22 was the commission from the minister originally that we can then bring together our conclusions uh, in, in one coherent framework that has um, involved the ICSs, ourselves, national partners, patients, uh, users, uh, with a view to the future in terms of what, 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 what we think the key drivers and the, the key choices that the system will have to make um, in the future, uh, partly at a very, uh, there were some very high level scenarios in there, but I think also um, that will then be the prerequisite for people to, to do much more detailed analysis and, and crucially actions people can take for the specific professions, pathways of care and the different regions um, and places in the system. So I just wanted to uh, draw people's attention to that. Um, I can talk in more detail to questions, um, David, but um, I just wanted to um, highlight that philosophy that sort of approach is going to underpin everything that, that we do. As I say, when we next meet in October, we'll have had the first cut analysis from, from Grant Thornton, and the team there is led by Professor John Took and Malcolm Low Lowry, so a really strong team, um, and uh, and all my colleagues within HE, ENI, and DHSC and Skills for Care, all the incredible resources and experience they've got too. So um, I'm really confident that... Um, both the content and the process that we've got will move us for, forwards as a system. Sure, thank you. Um, so let me open it up, uh, particularly with uh, that, that comment that we will have a workshop on this so we can analyse um, some of the detail and some of the uh, emerging themes uh, as we uh, 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 um, in the next um, in our next meeting. So this is mainly about process, but um, Soraya, please, and then Harpreet. Thank you, Sir David. Joe, thank you for the paper and really look forward to the next iteration and the workshop. Um, just a question, one of the factors um, around global um, sort of recruitment, et cetera, have, has it gone broader than just looking at UK? Because obviously notoriously in the health service, we yeah. go through our phase of recruitment from overseas and therefore whatever is happening globally is going to really impact on this. Yeah, absolutely. So global, uh, the, it'll be within the context of the workforce is a global market. So absolutely, it's the key part of our focus and context. I should say also that Lord Nigel Christ and Davina I met, met with um, about a month ago, the all parliamentary group that he chairs is also looking at similar issues, but very much from a global perspective. So we've agreed we're going to link really closely with, with him and his work so to make sure we can draw those parallels. And also Jed Byrne from our own NHS Global, working very closely with, with them. So, yeah. Lovely, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sir David. Actually, Sir Raj has asked my question. Mine was more on the international front, and, and I think okay. it was question on whether through our research we can do some desktop research on the international front because those areas that are less well resourced there might be some really innovative models there that they're using in terms of their workforce and how they engage and the skills they, they might use and I think that might well be relevant here so I think capturing that will be really good. Yeah it will and, and the group that Sir David's chairing is called an advice and challenge expert group sort of ACE for short that's got some really key international global experts on and that's a particular challenge David wanted so we could bring in you know what are other countries doing in this space the innovation that we can learn and lead from lead and learn from 
Uh, hi, Peter, I'm aware you've got international contacts as well. So um, may well be for a conversation between you and Joe, yeah. just to make sure we've got um, yeah. those right contacts. But I think the, the general point is we must look outwards, not just inwards, uh, for the mm -hmm. solutions to this. And um, that, 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 that group is in that spirit. So um, hopefully we've, um, uh, we'll be able to mine that uh, wealth uh, of experience and knowledge uh, through these conversations. Andrew George, please. Thank you, and and Joe, this process looks looks very fine. Two questions, one of which is around how are we going to communicate uncertainty? I mean, you indicated, of course, mm. that there is uncertainty, um, but people will look for the numbers; they won't look for the error bars. And and how 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 what's your philosophy around that one? And also noting the organisation submission profile that you include in the papers. Mm. Um, Healthcare providers. I mean, you know, eight percent is a reasonable number of comments around it. Um, universities, uh, ra rather. I, I guess my reflection is that a relatively small proportion of healthcare providers and universities, ha and perhaps other interested people, have uh, submitted. Now that's fine. There's no point squeezing submissions out of people who don't want to submit. But how do we engage them in this process going forward so they don't turn around? in two years, you know, in a year's time and say, nah, not very interesting. Um, it, it, so what's the communication package you're putting around to get this people who should be interested, but perhaps aren't interested? Do you want to pick them now, David, or take a round? Take no, them? let's take them all, because in a sense, I don't think you need to respond to absolutely everyone, Joe, given that we're going to come back in October. That's not to deny. These are all really important points, yeah. which are additional, but um, uh, this is the beginning of our board level conversation, it strikes me, about these important issues. So um, it's more important that um, uh, colleagues are able to share their perspective rather than you come back. Uh, some of them you'll pick up as you go forward with the work. Uh, Callum is next on, on, on my list. So Callum, please. Thank you, David. Uh, so just really maybe, maybe a couple of observations, as you say, rather than things Joe can think about. But uh, I think I'm, I'm sure she's already on with this. But uh, first one is just around timing. Uh, Obviously, we've we've uh, just in the process of resolving a three-year spending review um, settlement, uh, and you know this 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 piece of work will not uh, conclude until after that. Uh, however, I think it will be very helpful in terms of kind of continually reevaluating um, employment resource and prioritisation over the spending review period, and it's going to be really important for the next spending review, so SR24, this will be a really, really important plank of building up. In fact, I see this almost as the starting point for that. So I think it's, you know, this may seem quite a long way away, but it will very quickly become uh, the next thing. So I, actually, I think, you know, let, we need to think about how we, we flow this through into, into SR24. Um, and um, second point really is just about again thinking about spending review cycles and how we go about those and the fact that we're absolutely um uh, uh signed up and and um and, and want to go with an approach which is very much collaborative with nhs england because then he does has to serve the, the service um it's just really important obviously that this piece of work i think is equally owned by nhs england um mm. as well as an he thing and we just need to think about how we as we get towards the you know the, the the maturity of this how do we make sure that we kind of we make sure that's the case that it's not just an ag thing it's very much a, a service thing really important points calm thank you liz Mia. yeah it's just a quick comment um joe so great paper again and, and great to see that the people's advisory committee are going to be involved in some of the deep dive work because we've got a wealth of experience uh, on that committee so so thanks for building them in i'm sure we'll be delighted yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Uh, it was one of my points really about the importance of people with lived experience making yeah. a contribution to this mm -hmm. rather than um, this becomes an esoteric policy debate, which it dangerously could do if we're not careful. But um, it's a tricky conversation to have, is this actually. Um, um, uh, Andrew Morris, please. Thanks, David. Just to reinforce Callum's point, uh, I know that NHS um, England and Improvement are kicking kick off a big work with Tim Ferriss leading on transformation. It's really important that he, uh, he and I and HEE work together on this. So we're, we, 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 we have a common set of goals around the key themes, the key changes that we want to see in the workforce and work in unison. Um, 
So doing it from, right from the start is really, really important. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very uh, important point again. Um, so, um, Joe, uh, last word to you, I think. Uh, as, as I say, we are going to come yeah. back to this. So I, I don't think you need a, a detailed response to each of the points made, but just um, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. No, just just generally, thank you for people's comments. And you're absolutely right. We've set it up as a trilateral with the aim of feeding future SRs. But I think it's a, it's a really useful challenge too. We have to keep keep vigilant on that and proactive in that space to make sure that that ownership is real and that we've got a line of sight to outputs for timelines. Because you say this is not meant to be esoteric. When you know the, the the so what aspect of this is so important. This isn't for us to debate about the future. It's so therefore, what does that mean for the investment of public money in the workforce and how do we prioritize prioritise our spend as a system in the short, medium, long term between health and social care, some really live questions that will be answered by default anyway. We do this every time that we do or don't invest. The opportunity for this is to, that we do that in a, we do it deliberately with either some shared and certainties. And, and, and as David's right, uh, Andrew's right, sorry, we, we won't know everything, but at least we'll be taking, um, we'll, we'll be doing it knowingly and explicitly and with agreement with our partners if we get this right. And also, I think the point is that uh, hopefully this will be built into the rhythm of how HEE operates and this will be something that's iterated every year. So it'll be uh, framework 22, uh, framework 23, framework 24. I, I think how we turn this into a dynamic model and this is how we do our business is going to be a key uh, component to that. This for me is about the way we work rather than a report that will be published um, uh, and that would be the way that I'd like to begin to shape this work. Um, but Joe, thank you uh, for that. Um, if we could take the slide down um, and then I think we move on to operational uh, delivery and assurance and there's a report here on um, reset and recovery. Um, and David uh, Farrelly, are you going to lead us through this part of our conversation this morning? Thank you, thanks, David. Um, we've also got Lizzie Smith and Ruth Munger um, who have helped prepare the report on the call as well to help our conversation as we go. So if I just um, position it um, slightly. So obviously the report um, is in some ways a look back at the work we've been doing coming out of um, the third wave COVID and into, into this year um, in terms of supporting waiting list reduction. Um, and what we've tried to do is look at um, what we've got consistencies and differences across regions, both in terms of demographic differences that might give uh, a different set of priorities in how we approach waiting list reduction, but also looking at the similarities in terms of core work that's going on whether that's in skills development, in building capacity, in mm. supporting information and intelligence to make the right decisions. We've got that sort of commonality. What we've found by pulling, pulling this work together is where we've got consistency is the level of integration we've got with our regions and systems. But certainly in terms of how we work with um, providers, with other ALBs, and in particular, how we work with NHS e &I right through to our attendance at the regional leadership forums um, in conjunction with, with our um, colleagues. We have, as we've um, done some of the work, come across some challenges. So as we're seeing at the moment, high levels of activity in particular in A&E, in um, primary care, and also in ambulance services. Um, obviously that puts pressure on the work that we need to do ourselves, which is around um, increasing um, placement capacity at a time when services are stretched and pulled, um, in particular around supervision availability. Um, we've talked earlier about utilisation of educators, um, and these are some of the things that um, we're working with our colleagues through both people boards and workforce cells to try to get solutions to some of these issues. We're also looking at some of the impacts of the high activity levels and the focus on um, waiting list reduction on our own areas of work. And usually the impact on us is where, again, we require partner organisations to release people for supervision and for placement um, increase, such as for return to practice, etc. But we're also looking internally around whether we can optimise more our ways of working, in particular 
around um, some of our financial processes given were established to support long term planning and actually some of the pressures we got around how do we get some flexibility in short term planning to support systems getting through um, now and into the winter. Well, I mentioned the report is quite a look back over the last sort of six months to a year, really, on what we've been doing tangibly. We've really now got a focus on what we need to do going forward to support systems through planning for the winter, through vaccination rollout, and again, for weight and risk reduction. Now, what we're looking at is what's our role in short-term supply planning. And we're looking at short-term being, how do we work with partners to get through this next six months? So the sort of first yeah. heavy winter that we might well see with um, the potential of flu coming in that we didn't see last year, but also what happens after this year for the next two years. So relatively short term in terms of our usual planning system. Now, in most regions, we're also already getting some sense of priority in terms of um, how we need to work to support demand management around 999 demand and 111 call handling and whether there's things we can put in place to support skill development, skill uplift, or new um, supply routes to increase workforces in them areas. And also what's being highlighted is what are the opportunities around social care integration in health and healthcare roles that we haven't seen before. So we're already seeing a bit of um, an agenda coming through. What we do know is um, that 23rd of September, which is later this week, we should get the H2 guidance, which is the next short term guidance um, documentation, which will very clearly ask um, systems to work on a six month plan for short term recovery. So what are we going to do for this next month to reduce waiting lists and turn that recovery round? And we're very much involved and engaged in all of them discussions at all levels in all areas. Because some of the key things that will be asked of us to take a judgment on with colleagues in A&E are things like um, what, what are the workforce um, limiting factors in terms of preparing realistic and affordable workforce plans? Um, and what's realistic in terms of workforce growth, both in the short term, six months, in the two years we've looked at. But from our own point of view, we've still got to keep an eye on that sh long term um, planning forecast. Now, the trajectory for the turnaround of these plans is the 11th of November, and it's, it's, um, it's not a moving um, deadline. I think that's the, that's the date to get the plans in and to start delivery on them plans. So what we're trying to do now in HGE is to work through what's our offer framework to support this very short term six months and that two years um, approach. And we, we recognise there's a couple of pieces of work we need to do. One is to make sure that um, we're getting the most out of work that we're doing that's had the biggest impact. So sharing across regions and doing some work with our transformation collaborative to make sure um, we absolutely understand the highest impact inputs that we've developed and looking at the pace of rollout um, across all regions to, to get that sort of um, level of consistency. And we're also using our operational delivery group um, meeting next week to have um, a, a more integrated look. That group includes not just regions and transformation people, also um, a range of deans and service leads um, and some of the professional leads such as AHPs coming together to look across um, the pathways, across the professions and across the places um, to look mm. at what are the options and opportunities to do things slightly different um, than we've done before to get that short term offer written and available with a consistent narrative in October to help inform the um, H1 plans. I'm not going to say much more, David, um, around the document itself, but happy to open up for um, a conversation. And as I mentioned, we've got Lizzie here and Ruth to give some um, regional um, flavour and give you some a sense of what it really feels like at regions at the moment, um, working through both the planning framework, but also dealing with some of them um, current pressures that haven't really gone away. I think we've been seeing pressures in the system um, for some months now, and in particular ambulance services. And we, we've read um, around ambulance service needs in some areas military support. Um, and also we need to think around the paramedic pipeline, um, given that paramedics are now working in a range of areas, not just in emergency services, um, that is taking from the, the supply pipeline that we have originally um, established. So thank you, David, and over to Mark on the question. David, thank you. Um, well, why don't we, um, in welcoming uh, Lizzie and Ruth, um, 
why don't you just say a few brief words on uh, your, <coughs> pardon me, your regional experience, uh, and then I'll open this up more generally. Um, uh, so, uh, Lizzie, do you want to kick off, and then Ruth, I'll come to you. Um, I was actually going to suggest that Ruth took a lead because she's the author of the paper, and if I could follow her, is that okay? Um, I'm, I can clearly say I have no authority in this role. As well, as well, no ability. Ruth, you go then. <laughs> Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, so I think just in terms of the, the regional experience, I guess reflecting on the reset and recovery work, um, part of, of our thinking has been um, that this is this is now the kind of constant, um, you know, we used to just have winter pressures and obviously in the last two years it's been fairly constant short term ism um, and, and requirements on HE to be very responsive and very flexible. And we would anticipate that that's, that's going to be our way of working, um, you know, really for the next couple of years. The number of people waiting is so high um, that we won't be able to get through those waiting lists in, in you know, six months or something like that. Um, so there is something for us in HE, I think, about um, perhaps systemising a little bit more how we work in this, in this part of um, supporting the NHS um, with the kind of more flexible short-term um, responses that we can make. And some of that has been about bringing forward um, skills work that we're already doing, skills development work we're already doing, or increasing the, the um, capacity that we have, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I think um, that in terms of the money that's now um, come to NHS England and the ICS is looking at how they um, you know, can really usefully invest that funding um, to make a difference. What our uh, regional director in the southeast um, for NHS England has said she wants from the ICS is, um, is what she calls backable workforce plans. Um, you know, so it's got to be um, solid investment with um, the element of and how are you actually going to do that? Um, and I think that's where we can really come in and support um, with our knowledge and our expertise around workforce and workforce interventions to help the ICSs to produce those backable workforce plans for the for the immediate you know winter and then um, into the the next year as well of course um, you know of continuing to do HEE core business and longer term workforce planning and strategic thinking so uh, you know it's combining the two. Uh, really helpful and I think this emphasis on short-term skills development and that being an offer and how that becomes mainstreamed is key because the numbers for graduates coming through are hardwired in. They're, they're, they're not going to move now that the uh, September entries have been determined so um, the offer in the short term has got to be about skills development so uh, you make the point incredibly well Ruth. Now do you want to have a go Lizzie? If I could just add a couple of things. Thank you, David. Um, so the example that we gave in London was an interesting one, which is um, about the work that we've done to support um, the preparation for a likely RSV surge in children on the back of COVID and as we go through recovery. But what's really interesting about that example is it, it was something that started as the, um, the skills development commission that we got as HEE in London when the Nightingales were commissioned back on the 23rd of March uh, last year. And a number of people are nodding because we all remember that day well. Um, and so what I think is really nice about that example is it's an example of something that started on a very small scale, a re relatively small scale, now being scaled up as a national um, resource and a national solution because I think one thing that we need to look for is those opportunities to see whether local innovation works and then to quickly scale it up so that you're sharing it and that's been really good and what we've had around COVID in, in the London region and around all of the regions because we, we've heard about this all the time is a very fast cycle of, of innovation reflecting and learning in real time and then refining the offer and sharpening the offer um, and it makes me think of a conversation we had last week after the the informal exec and RD session, um, which was, you know, what is our role here and now in recovery? And actually what I think we've done through the COVID pandemic is we have, we've refined and sort of polished our offer. So whereas perhaps at the very beginning we started 
I don't like to use the word panic, but there was there was an element of panic in March in March uh, 2020, and the, the fact that we needed to step in and support any which way. That's now been refined and polished to us recognising where our skills, our resources, our expertise, our strengths really add value, and where perhaps we are better stepping aside um, and and letting others, you know. Uh, lead and manage the problems that they've got. Um, I think it's really interesting how this has driven the movement towards integrated planning and all the work that we've done in the operating model. So when you read through the examples from the different regions, many of them point to the need for really, really um, solid integrated planning across systems, because if you've got that and you can get those ICS workforce plans that Ruth's referring to in the southeast really solid, then that's a very, very good foundation to build on. And actually the COVID and the, the reset recovery has, has all indicated again, again, we've got immediate supply gaps. We are not going to solve them with long term supply, exactly as you say, Sir David. You know, we need to work differently and, and integrated planning will be uh, will unlock you know, the need to work differently. And just the last thing I would say is partnerships and collaboration, exactly as has been emphasized through the through the board members in terms of their ask to us to give the assurance on the on the quality of those partnerships and collaboration. It's absolutely central to this. Um, and it's it's leading and driving to stabilize, you know, the systems around things like the learner development, the skills development, anything else. But through those partnerships is what I think is proven through those examples that the regions have submitted yeah, to be really effective. Ruth, Lizzie, uh, really, really helpful and um, uh, a very good practical demonstration of some of the things that Health Education England colleagues are doing with I and E colleagues um, and with the ICS systems and with the local providers to actually make sure that uh, we do have a role to play. And I think this emphasis on skills development and your point, Lizzie, about where innovation has come from. Uh, and one of my notes to myself on uh, the the annex, the appendix, was how do we ensure that we're spreading that best practice and it is being adopted and spread. Um, the danger is that it's adopted in the area that within which it's been developed and not spread more generally. So um, bringing this material to a public board and um, some of the work that I know you and your colleagues will be doing is an important part of spreading. Uh, these uh, terrific, terrific examples of uh, agility and responsiveness to um, uh, some of the workforce pressures working alongside. And Lizzie, I think your point about where do we give way to other people because they're better placed to deal with something. Uh, again, that humility, I think, is actually uh, quite important to actually adopt that. So um, uh, really helpful conversation. So let, let me open it up now. And I think Andrew, uh, I think it was Andrew Morris first, but um, Andrew, over to you. Thanks, David. Really fantastic stuff in, in, the, in the paper. I'm really impressed. I, th I think um, from a, an E&I perspective, what we would like to move to is some sort of comply or explain um, approach, because where you've got you know really great examples of innovation and change that you know work, um, we would expect all regions, all ICSs to adopt them. And this is the only way we are going to transform services. We can't allow organisations to veto things where, you know, we know that there's, the evidence is there that a particular initiative works. So I would endorse, um, you know, a kind of national approach to, to these things that have proven to work and are very, very cost effective. So power to, you know, everything that you've done, because it really is fantastic stuff and I'm really impressed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, David, uh, Lizzie, um, you might pick up on um, this issue about how we spread and how that through the RD network, you're taking that back into the regions and actually uh, making the knowledge of what works in London. So Lizzie, your point on um, the first of the examples in the uh, appendix, how that might benefit, I'm making this up now, how that might benefit the Northwest and just pick up on uh, and Andrew, and Andrew's point as we go forward. Andrew Foster, please. Thank you. I mean, I think one of the things that we've reflected on quite a bit as a board is the the, the mixed um, perceptions in the NHS in terms of the provider organisations as to, you know, what do the Romans ever do for us? What does AGE ever do for us? And this paper here gives a really brilliant set of 
very practical examples of exactly what HEE does do for us. And, you, you know, I am I'm sure we're all very well aware that providers are under incredible pressure at the moment, probably more pressure than they've ever been. So the more that we can demonstrate where HE is being helpful, the better. So I've just got one sort of question, and it may be a difficult one, but in, in rather than just sort of asserting we are doing things to help the NHS, is there any way of measuring the contribution that we're making? Is there any way of looking at a series of metrics in regions which they might want to choose for themselves so that we can say this is what we set out to do and this is what we actually did. So that's my question. Uh, if I may, Andrew, I'd, can I just come in on that? That was my key point when I read the report. We we claim a lot like our reputation has improved. I think we should have some humility about that, to be honest. But how do we measure that? What what What's the measurement in it? And I, I, I thought as we develop our approach, I'd like to encourage us to think about what are the metrics that demonstrate that we are uh, making um, the progress that is being uh, set out here. There is something about qualitative feedback, that's the feedback you'll get when you're in your local conversations, but there's also something uh, about quantitative feedback. If it, I, I, I think that picks up on uh, and Andrew's point as well, which is uh, one of my observations. Uh, Soraya, please. Um, thank you. Thank you, David and colleagues. Um, I think what's really critical is the learning. And I think some of these case examples that you've given at the end in the report are really excellent. Um, but also learning from how we can break down the barriers between the professions, um, because it may be one region has been more successful in that and upskilling certain types of staff um, and how that can be really spread. So I think where we've got these key exemplars, whether it's initiatives whether it's upskilling of different uh, clinical professions to deliver, how do we get that spread out and then encourage the ICSs to really accelerate this? Because that will be the trick across all of this. And I think HEE is probably the repository of the data and the information of what's happened. I mean, I'm not excluding the others, but it's really about spreading that and it would be critical. Really helpful. Uh, I want to come back on the, the spread bit, um, uh, if I may. Uh, Rob, please. Yeah, I just wanted to touch Lizzie's comments about um, this being a kind of basis for the integrated planning work we want to do. We all know that the solution to these challenges uh, is the impact of the different levers, not, not you know, and it's great that we can make this contribution. Um, and the power of doing that integrated planning approach that asks the question, it says, what are you doing in each of the domains? And I think that then comes on to Andrew's point about saying, um, can you explain or comply? Uh, you know, rather than it being a kind of scattergun, oh, we're doing this over here or, or this is nice. And then it comes on to Andrew's uh, Foster's point, which is if you've set ambitions for each of the levers, you can monitor it. Uh, and, I, and I think we should look to set an ambition. You know, so rather than it just being a we're going to do some work here, we could say, well, what impact do we think that work will have? And then you can monitor it. And then you can do a PDSA cycle, can't you? Um, and I think that's the kind of ideal of this, which is that you get uh, a bit like, bit like Joe's trying to do for 15 years out, which is what, what are the set of common assumptions you've got to solve this problem now? And can we then observe it? And as we've said, you know, where we see something working, how do we share it quickly? Yeah, very good. Uh, very good points, Rob. Uh, thank you. Uh, Andrew George? Thank you. I, I, I want to talk about the spread aspect of it because, you know, this is a really complicated thing. It's something that we, in all aspects of the NHS, we've really struggled with um, across it. And um, there may be some learnings, for example, from the AHSNs where, you know, you could argue that the AHSNs historically have done local initiatives and done them rather well, but failed to spread them. You then have central bodies saying, right, then we can have central initiatives. And you have a whole load of slightly half-baked central initiatives that are in some cases are under evidenced um, and that they are then imposed on people and it becomes yet another 25 initiatives that somebody's got to do. So it's a really complicated thing, this spread. And diktat doesn't work. Um, it's um, bottom up doesn't work either. Um, and I just wonder whether there are some learnings from the HSNs that we could do um, that would that would help because some of the things they've done have been good and some of the things as a chair of an HSN, I must admit, have been less successful. So, yeah, thank you. 
really helpful. Um, and I think the regional variations are actually flagged in the report in some of the analysis as well, which plays to this point about the different challenges in different regions when it comes to adoption and spread. Uh, Joe. Thanks. I think it builds on, on, on that point a bit. because, From my perspective, the breakthrough that the regions have made here is, is, is not just in the activity that HE has done, but to get that understanding within ourselves and the system. That, as Rob was saying, it's action at all levels that, that, that between us as a system, we need a supply strategy. It's a combination of retention, international recruitment, deploy-led practices, the things that we can do in education training in the short and the medium and the long term. But it's that clarity that it's it's everybody's responsibility and what the combined impact. And if we can get that, it's less about being sure, you know, what is HE delivering, but what are we collectively as a system? Do we understand what our different levers are and what the combined impact of the, can, them can be? And I think that's, from my point of view, and what Lizzie and, and Ruth think, that's the breakthrough we seem to have made over the past year. And, and that's that's been long and hard fought for. We've not been able to do it for decades. So I wouldn't want to lose that by going back to turning this into a conversation about HEE. I think that would be a backwards move. Um, but I think it's a fantastic paper. And to your point, um, Andrew, about sharing, uh, whether it's top down or bottom up, maybe it's that understanding about the different actions required to incre increase net supply regardless of where it comes from as long as we've got that understanding and that's our strategy that's that's the prize here from my point of view yeah these are not uh binary choices are they in that sense and i, I think this is the challenge around this debate about bottom up top down is how we avoid it becoming a binary debate it, it seems to me that um um, the decision to registration for nurses should be on academic years, not calendar years, can only be taken at a national level. It, it, it can't be taken locally. Um, yet, as a supply initiative, that's been pretty significant, it strikes me, as getting people into the workforce sooner. And I think if you just look at uh, one of the themes through the conversation, being clear what can be done nationally, what can be done regionally, what can be done at system level and what can be done at employer level, uh, I think is uh, a really important uh, part of the conversation. Otherwise, you just have a scrum of everybody trying to do everything for everybody else. And that is not efficient or productive or effective. Um, and, you know, the top and bottom of it is some things are just better done locally and the national organisations are better not involved in those. But similarly, there are some things around regulation, the legislation, the allocation of resources, perhaps uh, that are best done at a, a national level. And just being really clear about where uh, the allocation of role and responsibility can be uh, will, will help. But um, um let me, um, um, David, um, this is Ruth, do you want to come back on this? I don't think you need to go through the points. I think I think they stand for themselves. I want to say something about dissemination, but um, just before we wrap up this item, um, uh, David, I'll come to you last. Um, uh, Lizzie, on the basis you went last last time, on the basis I am chairing this meeting, do you want to go now? <laughs> I will absolutely do that. Oh, no, so the, the point I would make, um, it sort of follows on the back of, of all of the comments, is that the difference for me now is the engagement of different sorts of people in this in these problems. So, you know, we used to have sort of HEE problems and, you know, providers have provided problems and so on, but now there are, there are now recognised to be placed-based, well, place-based workforce problems and the sort of people that see those as being part of their uh, their part of their agenda part of their portfolio are totally different sorts of people and that's a great opportunity so this engagement into different sorts of people you know you know chief finance officers of systems or um you know sros of of a place or whatever and now have now got these sorts of things in their mind and 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 they and they can see through the experience of the last 18 months how this collaborative working and what the different parts of the system bring can start to solve problems we've seen that with the ophthalmic pathway we've seen it with the cancer pathway you know these sorts of um pathway approaches to looking at a place and solving a problem so i think we've got a fantastic opportunity but all of the comments and challenges around Around adoption spread scaling up you know learning stepping back are things that we just need to keep in our minds but I do feel um, that we've got a moment 
on this um, and and we're really well positioned um, to step in and, and really move move ourselves forward as a system around workforce on the back of this. That sounds a bit grand, but I think that is the case. I'll stop well, there. Not, not grand. Uh, in a sense, well, I think what you're capturing is a potential shift in the culture where workforce becomes something that everybody owns and therefore the contribution to the solution. And that is a significant change. And that it's a powerful point, uh, Lizzie, um, and a massively, massively important point. Ruth? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think in terms of particularly the way we're working with the NHS England regional teams, that is shown by the fact that we're working across all the directorates and functions. Um, so most of our time is probably spent, certainly in my experience, with um, the improvement function and the nursing function and perhaps less of our time with the people function, which may not be what people would ex expect. But that's been really helpful because that you know that's how we can direct our effort you know really on on to work that will improve patient care so i think um that's something we're really trying to to enhance and and build across our teams so that we're linking our teams across all of the functions that nhs england um have um and then just on a sort of more um internally reflective bit around spread. I think putting the paper together, I was in the very fortunate position of getting all these examples in from my my colleague RDs. Um, you know, and, and of course I thought, well, we why haven't we ever told each other that we're doing all of these things? Um, because there were certainly two or three things in there that I thought, oh, I'd be interested to do that, you know, or promote that in the Southeast. So I think that's something piece of learning for us as a group about how we work together and share more of what we're doing um, and some of the real practical stuff about how we're getting it done as well. Okay, uh, Naveen, I've seen your hand and I'll, I'll come to you. D David, do you want to come in? Just, just a, couple of, a couple of points, um, thank you. I think, um, stick up on Lizzie's point, I, I sort of also feel that we, we're in that sort of moment because we've got um, the work on our operating model coming together. So there's two parts of that. There's the operating model itself, which we need to be able to describe our approach to learning and sharing and improvement. And we're also developing an ICS relationship guidance, which actually will embed that really in terms of how we want to work with systems and get these sorts of messages out. Um, we've also got a piece of work going with the IHI on understanding our own improvement methodology um, way of working. And I think given the point around um, where the AHSNs could help us, there's probably another route that we could pick up on to engage with the IHI on, on what our um, sharing and learning methodology should be. And I just think the last point again to pick up on what Ruth said, I think the exercise of coordinating this piece of work has been really useful. Um, so it gets um, people wanting to share, wanting to collaborate more, but also wanting to do it in a very structured way so we don't lose it, hence our, our role with um, bringing in the transformation collaborative to make sure we're facilitated and we don't lose any of the learning um, by, by doing it just amongst ourselves. So I think quite a lot of good points, Dave, that I'll pick up on, certainly around metrics and trying to move away from high impact best practice examples to something more concrete as we sort of roll out the system. Okay, very good. Naveena? Actually, um, David, everything that I wanted to say has been said by the team. How cool is that? Um, so, <laughs> less is more. But you're showing off now. Uh, so, um, this has been terrific. Uh, generally, it's been absolutely fantastic. And um, I, I'm absolutely delighted uh, for uh, two or three reasons. One is this is a demonstration of our purpose in action. Why are we here? It's to do the education and training. It's a demonstration of why we should work collaboratively because we're stronger by working with others. And it's a fabulous demonstration, David F, of the work that you've been doing with Lizzie and Ruth and the other regional directors about uh, the importance of your role uh, in uh, taking the organisation forward. So um, a big, big um, congratulations to um, David, to you and uh, Lizzie, Ruth and your regional director colleagues. Uh, I, I have to say it's been terrific. Um, I would just like to say, uh, sorry, and also the benefit of you as regional directors coming to the board. I, I, I can imagine hearts sank when you got another meeting scheduled into your diary. Uh, but please do not underestimate the value that you can add through the contribution that you can make. 
um, if we're going to stop bottom up and top down becoming a binary choice, we need to connect it and we need to be seen to connect it. And uh, I think this conversation is one of the ways that as a board we're able to do that by uh, you coming in. We can do it with uh, as an employer by uh, inviting our staff to come to the board to share their lived experience of staff. But it's important uh, we get this. And, and, and of course, um, Lizzie is uh, leading the work with us on in, involving people who are using services, which is an important uh, uh, vehicle that we've got. But I wonder, um, David, if I could encourage you uh, to, to um, have some discussion with Lee about the communication point. I don't know how we disseminate this report more broadly. Uh, I was going to ask that we formally send this report to each of the regional directors and the regional people directors but given what Ruth said I wonder whether we send it to the P regional leads on the improvement and the nursing functions as well and um, I don't know whether it's possible um, to extract uh, this item uh, as a because we've been recording it I think we've been going for 40 minutes if uh, if I've clocked this correctly uh, extract this item and send this video clip with people because they'll be able to get a sense of the nature of the conversation as well. And I'm just thinking about how we can extend. Um, I'm useless at social media, but there might be a guru somewhere that can actually um, demonstrate how we can actually get this link out much more broadly to people who are working at an organisational and at a system level to begin to inform that debate uh, and that then lets people see what we're doing it opens us up to challenge but it also opens us up to support as well from the work that we're doing so if i could just ask we give some thought to that uh, please um we don't let's not have the discussion here that's the wrong place to have it but um we, i think we should think creatively about how we can spread uh, some of this work as well um Maybe Andrew Morris uh, making it available to some of the people on the I and E board as well. Uh, whilst they've got a lot to read, I think this is an important demonstration. So, um, uh, Nicola, you want to come in? Just to say, David, that is completely possible, and we can chop up the recording and extract this section so it has its own link. Good. Okay. Well, that's um, perhaps worth doing, and um, whether people click on the link or not uh, can be. Um, their own decision but um, if we could make it available that would uh, I think be terrific. Um, I think that um, uh, no, um, no contribution from me gets us um, to the end of the agenda. I've not been notified of any other business. Um, Naveena do you have any? Is there anything? No? Okay. Um, so um, uh, not elegantly chaired, but clearly the construction of the agenda and the timings have been absolutely perfect. So we're just two minutes over. So thank you, everybody. Um, Ruth, um, Lizzie, uh, thanks for joining us and uh, contributing to that item. Uh, other colleagues, I think um, I think we should go for the full half an hour, Nicola, if we're 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 on good time. So okay. um, I think this is to invite people to um, be back for the private board session, which is to commence at 12 o'clock. So with that, thanks very much, everybody. And um, if you're coming back, I'll see you in half an hour. If you're not coming back, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. We'll end the recording and the live stream now. Thanks. <laughs>